Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Chris Rocchio. Uh, today, we're going to talk about his background and his Sun Eater series. Chris, how are you doing, my friend? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. Hey, always a pleasure. So let's get started. Tell us a little bit about where you're from, why you started writing, how you got into the publishing business. Yeah, sure. So I was born and raised in Raleigh, North Carolina. I started writing like if seriously is the right word when I was like eight years old, right? Like I've always been writing and I knew that was what I wanted to do. You know, as like, like every one of us, probably I wanted to be an astronaut, you know, but I realized not very good at math. So I kind of backed into an English education, which I would not recommend, you know, going to school for that, you know, really to anybody, but you know, I ended up really, you know, doing it anyway. And it worked out though, because I got an internship with Bain Books, like right after, right around the time I was graduating my last year. And I got the job right after I graduated, which was also right when I sold my first book, Empire of Silence. It was like two or three weeks after I got out of school. So fortunately, you know, playing with no net, I managed to, you know, not hit the ground. So you sold your first book when you were what, 22, 23? 22. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it, it ended up being stuck in like editorial development hell for a couple of years didn't come out until I was 25. Just, you know, publishing is like that sometimes. But yeah, I sold it when I was 22. And I've been working as a writer and I worked as an editor at Bain for about seven years. And I quit last May. And now I'm writing full time. It's been fun. But it's about as far as the writing stuff is concerned, it was about as like archetypal a writing journey as anybody, right? I, I had access to like the CIFLA directory with all the agents because I was working at the office. But that only just saved me Googling time, right? I went and got an agent the traditional way. I managed to, to get one about two months before I graduated. And so publishing shuts down completely in December. So we kind of like, you know, just wait until January, then we'll start selling the book. And it, it went pretty quickly. And I've been with Daw Books, who are, you know, part of Penguin Random House ever since. And I've lived this weird double life in publishing for a long time. Even some conventions that have two badges, you know, one for the editorial stuff and one for being an author and depending on which door I needed to get through I'd swap them out. But, you know, like I say, that's that sort of double life is resolved. And now it's, you know, all writer all the time. I actually just finished my last anthology for Bane, World's Long Lost, which you're in. So, you know, it was my, my last sort of hurrah as an editor. So I do want to talk about that, but let's, let's put that toward, toward the, the end. So when you first sure. got your contract, I guess you're 22 years old. Did you do did you write any short stories prior to that like did you go through that like submitting and submitting hell that a lot of other writers go through or did you just go straight to novels and i went really straight to the novel uh you know short stories i wrote a couple for classes when i was in college right because i foolishly like, went for the you know the creative writing minor right uh, so i'd done a little bit in that department i think i might have tried to sell a couple of them so i got the you know the 20 minute clark's world rejection right and uh, <laughs> so fast on that turnaround it's uh it's amazing i and actually think that's a mercy for most people because you don't have to sit there and wait you just get your i'd rather get a quick rejection than a long rejection. Than wait. yeah but yeah. i did you know you everyone's heard the story about stephen king you know stapling his rejections to his wall right i was like that sounds biblical and i should do that and after about you know, 20 or so rejection letters getting pinned up from agents for the novel. I was like, these have to come down. This is depressing. And I think I went through 50, 51 rejections trying to get an agent for the novel. So it's not like I, I haven't played that game. It was just for the longer format. And it's, man, it's it's not fun, right? Like it's, it is absolutely a mill. And, but, you know, I, I think it was 51. I finally, I've got an agent. So it was like all of 2015, I was I was applying for for agents. You usually you never even hear back, right? So there wasn't always a letter to nail up. So 20 was getting close to the end of that list, but it all ended up working out fortunately. And I've been with the same agent ever since, and and it's been more or less textbook, you know, as far as the relationship between publisher agent and me goes. Right? It's you know the way the model is supposed to work, right? So. So let's talk about the Sun Eater series. How did you come up with the idea? What's it for people who are not familiar with it? I would tailor it for folks like that. So for kind of a new audience, yeah. what's what's the series about? Where did it come from? How did you develop it? And what sorts of things should people look for when they read it? 
Yeah, so the Sun Eater is a sort of space opera in the tradition of Dune, in the tradition of Star Wars, both of which were things that I was a big fan of growing up, right? And so it's set about 20,000 years into our future, not a galaxy far, far away. My main character is a young nobleman, Hadrian, who runs away from home. He wants to be sort of a scholar, but also sort of like a you know space explorer, right? His dad wants him to be a priest. And he ends up getting stuck in the middle of a war between the human empire and these aliens, the Cielsen, who kind of play the role of the Huns to the Empire's Rome, right? And, and he tells you on page one, the book's written like a memoir, that he's the man who ended that war and dealt with the Cielsen and his story is why and how and about all the things that are not in the official history, right? So it's, it's all first person, it's all, you know, memoir, it's pretty subjective and it's about, you know, we play a lot with like what the truth is, right? And, and, and things like that. So it's, you know, comparable to Book of the New Sun, Wolf, which is one of my other favorite uh, favorites. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of little oh, that's bit of, that's the one about like a Roman legionnaire. Uh, no, he's got a, he does have a series that's about a that's about a Greek guy, but it's uh, that's the one about the torturer in the distant future who mm. you know sort of like becomes king and stuff, right? But it's it's also written in the sort of memoir format, and and so it's it's four books now. The fifth book is coming out in December. It will be seven, so I've got two more to write. And then that will, that'll sort of put the capstone on everything, but it's very kind of Romano Byzantine inspired. I was also, because I I hate money, I was a classic student as well. And so it pulls a lot from, you know, Suetonius and a lot of the other, the other sources Mm -hmm. just to sort of. So for the world building, right? To sort of get that texture in there. And, and, and was uh, any any Tacitus in that at all? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. You've got the classic, you know, a desert called peace reference in there somewhere. You can't you can't slip uh, a Tacitus reference in and not do that one, right? So uh, the Empire in Hadrian's time, right, is very self consciously pulling from human history, right? This is a civilization that overcame machines, right? There you see the Dune DNA, right? Mm-hmm. And and has decided to be very self-consciously human, right? So their institutions are deliberately archaic. I had a I had a fan write a medium piece uh, about the books once, and he was like, you know, at what point does like LARPing, you know, finally become real life, right? And you know, this is a culture that is like, well, you know, we, you know, we're human and we won the war with the robots, right? So like, how do we be human, right? And they go back to history and and sort of put it all together. And it's been so long at this point, thousands of years, that it's just real life to everybody. Like Nobody remembers that this was a deliberate decision their ancestors, you know, put together to feel Roman again. Because you have to explain, right, as a science fiction writer, how do we get back to these archaic institutions, right? Because you want the archaic institutions because they're cool dramatically, right? And because if you've got lords and kings and things, then you have a smaller cast of characters because nobody wants to read the, you know, the science fiction epic about board meetings and bureaucrats, right? Like, you don't want that. You want, you want kings and duels. Well, it depends. It depends. It depends yeah. on how, I, I think, I think it can be done. DJ but. DJ Butler, DJ Butler might have a bone to pick with that one when he's talking yeah, about well, joint stock companies. And... With Dave. But I, I do think that's where the tendency in a lot of this kind of science fiction to like go for the archaic institutions come from. There's like a romance to it, right? And and so and so that was sort of it ended up being a real kitchen sink of a series for me, right? Uh, it's got like basically all of my ideas that I've had as I've been writing since I was a kid, right? Thrown into it. So it's got. It's got this space opera feeling to it. There's some like, there's some hard science in it, but there's also some like more fantasy feeling elements. You know, you've got your gladiator fights, you've got your, you know, duel at dawn, you know, situations, you've got space battles, you've got palace intrigue and, you know, murder and, and all of that stuff. Right. So it, it's really got a, got a broad canvas to it, despite being one point of view character the whole time. Right. And so it's been, it's been really fun and it's been a real, it's been a real challenge too because they're not short books right so if you're looking for a series that's like you know all door stoppers sun eater is one for you so what do people like most when you look at the reviews about the series uh so the things i mean character is one thing that gets sort of highlighted because we're living in this guy's head all the time right we get to spend a lot of time with him right and he you know it kind of like hamlet right is always second guessing his motivations for things and so we spend a lot of time sort of with this one guy right and learning about who he is and why he made this you know he 
committed war crimes basically right you know and he's not the sort of person you'd expect to do that right so it's a it's a pretty serious you know psychological study right in addition to being the sort of you know dark and swashbuckling you know sort of galaxy spanning you know adventure story and so there's that people do single out my my prose right which is really nice right because i like i like to think that i'm i'm good at it right and so to have people compliment me that is really is really flattering uh but i do have a bit more of an old school sort of literary style right I, I grew up reading tolkien you know and so my my writing sort of tends in that more archaic direction because tolkien's writing style was dated even when he wrote right in the 50s and 40s right it was it was deliberately pretty old school because he grew up reading like haggard and stuff and and so there's there's a bit of that that gets that gets brought out but i also you know people will talk to about how like you know, I've got characters that have conflicting worldviews, right? And I really look at those conflicting worldviews and how they, you know, they might not have a resolution. They may not be able to agree on things, but I don't, I try really hard not to give my characters short shrift, right? Even if they have a philosophy that I think is, you know, stupid or even evil, right? You know, I want to make sure, because the characters won't feel that way. And one of the, one of the things that makes drama different from polemic, right, is that like, it's about people. Right. It's not about, you know, it should be about people first. Right. It can be about ideas. But if you've got a, a cast of characters, right, they shouldn't, you know, be simpatico on every issue. Right. There should be tension and real life is messy. These things don't get resolved. And that is something that's really important to me as a storyteller. Right. Is is portraying people. Right. And not trying to beat, you know, the reader over their head with you know, what I think is right, or even what my main character thinks is right, right? I, you want your main character getting beaten over his head for his beliefs too, right? So there's a lot of conflict, you know, physical and, and ideological that I think I, I, I like to emphasize. So. Is there anything about the series that echoes contemporary events and things like that? Or is it kind of relatively divorced from all that uh not deliberately uh i had i, I <laughs> this so the, the one thing that comes to mind is there is there's a bit in the fourth book right so we're pretty far in the series where we're dealing with speech codes and this pretty oppressive sort of uh foreign state and i was writing a uh a chase scene that takes place after curfew when my city was locked down. And that was an accident. I wasn't planning on it. I don't think that people reading it will be able to not help but think that it was a response to something when in fact it had been part of the outline for years and years before, right? I just happened to, sometimes life resembles art, right? And uh, it just happened to work out that way. But I, I try not to be a, you know, a polemicist or something like that. Most of the historical events that will have inspired this stuff are 2000 years old, right? There's, you know, echoes of these sort of like Hunnic migrations that menace mm -hmm. Rome in the general setup here with the aliens invading, because the aliens are migratory. They don't have home planets of their own, right? They just travel in these big fleets. And that's kind of comparable to like the way that, you know, the Huns or the uh, Sarmatians or whoever would act when they came into Rome, right? They would, you know, just swoop in through Germania off the steps and, and you know, they didn't settle down. They just wanted to take stuff and push their herds around. So most of the historical reference are going to be a lot older than that. It's not going to be about stuff that happened in the last couple of years. Because I think that that kind of, I, one, I don't think that human situations change that much. So there's, there's a universality mm. to problems, right? you know, that people can relate to. So you don't need to pull from something that's like in the news cycle. And often if you do, I think you lose readers and often you lose the readers that you like, maybe you're most trying to reach, right? And so I, I try not to, you know, dictate so much as entertain, right? Or, or, you know, just to present a situation. So, you know, so yeah, I, I pull from history, but, but usually not from the immediately relevant parts of it. Now, in addition to your Sun Eater series, you've also produced several anthologies. Let's talk through some of them. What was the first one you did? And then you have one that's coming out, you know, first one and then everything in between. And then you have one coming out in December. You should talk yeah, about. so the first one I did was a book called Star Destroyers with Tony Daniel, who used to be senior editor at Bain. He's since, he's since moved on. And it was sort of the classic like Bain book sort of short story collection. It was it was about large, large naval engagements. That was basically, I think the tagline for the book is big ships blowing things up. 
which was Tony's copy. I did not write that. And <laughs> and it was just that, right? It was about space battles, more or less, right? And so I got to do that because I had been an intern and I was an unpaid intern. So they thought, hey, you know, you've stuck it out for a year now. You've done good work. Why don't we at least put you on a book, right? So we can get you some money, right? And you can write a story too. So you get paid twice. And so that was, uh, it ended up not coming out until after I was, I was on the payroll. So it was a little bit moot, but we had in-house editors making anthologies anyway. So it was still a good fit. And so Tony and I did that. It was all original stories and it was pretty much all Bane books authored. We weren't going out and really trying to find new talent or anything. It was all in-house. So we got like David Drake did a story, you know, uh, Jody Lynn I, a lot of just regular Bane mainstays. But the actual first bit of my work that was published was in that, was in that anthology. It came out about three months before Empire of Silence did. And it's a story called Not Made for Us, which is set in the Sun in your universe. It's just about a grunt, right? A legionary and in his first engagement with these aliens. So I get to do the grounds eye, you know, view of the war because it's usually Adrian himself is is really, you know, up with the movers and shakers and he isn't down in the trenches that much. And so being able to look at the war from a different perspective, right? And and to look at the aliens, you know, head on as opposed to on the more strategic level was was a nice change. And that's still a story that I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of because it's also a first person story, but it's a very different narrative voice. So that was a fun sort of like literary flex, right? It was like, can I write another character that closely? So that was the first one I did. And then most of the anthologies since, well, all of them fell into one of two groups. It was either all new stories or it was like all reprints because I did a lot of books with Bain's editor at Meredith, Hank Davis, who'd been working since like the 80s, right? And he would go through and collect stories from the 30s, 40s, 50s that all fit a theme. And mostly what I did with those was push the paperwork. I had to go figure out who the agents were, you know, who was representing an author's estate. So I got to talk to Robert Heinlein's estate manager or like A. Van Vogt's widow, right? And so, which was like really cool for me as like a, like an old school fan, because most of the stuff that I grew up reading was like, like, like 50s and earlier, right? like pre-New Wave mm -hmm. stuff because of the the people who introduced me to the field were older fans, right? So like, you should read Van Vogt. So I have a, very little in common with like a lot of readers my age because they're reading, you know, they're reading Brandon Sanderson or, you know, or Dave Weber, Larry Correa, right? To speak about pain writers. And I'm over here reading like, you know, not just Lovecraft, but like Clark Ashton Smith and Neil Moore and stuff. So I'm- uh, really By the way, like, by the way, I love Clark Ashton Smith. He's like, so in fact- in fact, he is, I think he grew up several, uh, well, pr pr pretty far from here, but still kind of in, in Northern California. So it was, where was it? Being with an A. Why could I not remember it off the top of my head? But there's a, there's a place up in, if you go up I-80 a ways, is it I-80? I can't, no, it's, that's probably wrong. But no, that's right. That's right. It's. Why can I not remember? It's not Augustine, but it begins with an A. Yeah, I don't I don't remember. I, I'm not up on his biography so much. Yeah, but he, he grew up in kind of Northern California, not quite as nor far north as Lake Tahoe, but somewhere in between north of Sacramento. Yeah, he's so good, though. Called him the best writer in their little group. And I, I think he's right. You know, I, it, it, what was that story? It was like the City of Shining Lights or the City of... I think that's right. It's where they yeah. go to this, 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 like this kind of rock in the middle of nowhere. And it's like the bug zapper. It's like the, the giant intergalactic yeah, yeah, bug yeah, zapper. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it is shining lights. I'd have to double check. It, um, I'm not doing, I'm not doing it justice by describing it that way. It's just the way it's written. It's just the one sense of I, wonder. I usually, I usually tell people if they, if they really like Lovecraft and they've read all of Lovecraft, just go read Smith because it's, 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 more of the same as selling it short because like he kind of like co-created that whole sort of that whole sort of subgenre, right? You know, and like I mean Lovecraft name checks him in Mountains of Madness, right? He says, like, this stuff we're seeing is like something out of a Clark Ashton Smith painting, right? You know, in in Mountains of Madness, right? So like like he's a real guy that wasn't something like Lovecraft made up, right? But he's so good. Um, well, he's got another. He's got another short story. It's like the Tombs of Vovambus or so, something like that. It's the the one where they go in that in that cavern in Mars, and there's some like creature that they unearth that basically wraps itself around people's heads, and and it's just 
it, it sounds trite when I describe it, but just the way that he writes, it just creates a hypnotic sort of mood when you read it that it's, you have to read it just to understand it because it's yeah, really I, I hard to replicate. Enough. Recommend him enough. He's so good. There's so many writers from that period that just don't get read anymore. Like, like even like C.L. Lore and Henry Kuttner were like huge in their day, right? And like nobody, just nobody reads them, right? And uh, she's uh, C.L. Moore is another one. She's great, right? Like if you like your cosmic horror stuff, you know. So that was I grew up reading a lot of that stuff. I can't remember. Yeah, particularly that. for cosmic horror, like he is a must read for you know anything cosmic horror. If you're writing cosmic horror and you haven't read Clark Ashton Smith, you're not you know you're not you're not doing it right like you yeah, just it, it's it's about as bad as not reading lovecraft right you know it's just not he yeah it's required reading it really is yeah i mean he almost he almost took it to like uh an art he kind of took what hp lovecraft did and just really elevated it in such yeah, a I way yeah i think he's that... a finer writer right i mean lovecraft gets dinged for his for his prose usually I don't think that's so much the problem. I think the problem with Lovecraft, right, is just that he doesn't trust his readers very far. You know, he, he feels the need yeah. to, like, explain everything all the time. And Smith is a, a lot more measured in doing that. I think I think I enjoy his stories more, right? That's not, I don't mean that as a criticism of Lovecraft either, right? He's obviously, he's Lovecraft, right? But uh, yeah. but I think Clark's, Ashton Smith is the better writer. By the way, it's Auburn, California. I looked at Auburn, ah, there we go. Yeah, I knew it began with an A. I was going to look it up, but when I when I try to type and also talk, like it's really obvious to what I'm doing. So, uh, well, it's probably obvious when I was doing it too. But <laughs> I, who knows? <laughs> I'm not smooth. So, but yeah. So I forget why I was bringing all this up because I can talk about this stuff all day. Oh, but... you were you were talking about your work on anthologies and what inspired you. Oh, right. You? What are so the I would do a bunch of these reprints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so we would sort of go back and forth. So Hank would usually have. A uh, theme he wanted for the book and he'd have a list and I'd be the one to go track them down. So I did a lot of those, but then I did a bunch of um, uh, a bunch of original story ones too. My the one that's nearest dearest to my heart is sort of Planet, right? Because talking about older style stuff, I really like the like Lee Brackett, Edgar Rice Burroughs sort of space <laughs> fantasy vibe, right? So I did it's kind of what I write, right? So I did a collection of those stories and it was all all originals. Uh, Simon R. Green did his first Deathstalker story in 30 years for that book, which was really awesome that he would, you know, pull the series out of, out of mothballs to, to add a story to the collections. Really, really cool. And those are fun. They're kind of a parody of the genre, but you know, it's when you write an anthology, edit an anthology, you want like a pretty wide variety of tone and, and things. So getting the kind of jokey thing and especially to get it from this sort of like you know old school kind of legendary series was really was really cool but then the last book right world's long lost it's out in december it's speaking of lovecraft it's uh it's uh cosmic horror sort of xeno archaeology stories they're not all cosmic horror some of them are are closer to the archaeology end we got kind of a broad spread on it but you know your story for that was was pretty was pretty cosmic horror out you know outright right and you know so was mine was sort of right in the middle right but we had some that were you know just about finding old alien artifacts in space right and what are they and you know we had a we had a pretty good spread of writers on that one adam oyabanji who's a got his first book coming out in i think it's his first book i don't want to misspeak adam if you see this i think it's his first book breaking day is out in a couple months he's another daw writer but we'd looked at his book at bain right but they we got outbid and, and tony was really uh bruised about losing him so we got him in the collection for that it's a really great story that one's more on the like outright archaeological end of the, of the spectrum for the collection but we got les johnson who's an actual you know like nasa scientist right to do it <laughs> you know, main mainstay too. The story for the collection. I'm really happy with how it's come out. I just turned it in last week, actually. So it's off to the copy. Editor. Really? Like, yeah. I think I turned, I turned my story in like last year. I know. I got stuck. We got stuck waiting on Orson Scott Card who did a story. Oh, well, he's worth, he's worth waiting for though. It's, yeah. It you know. ended up scheduling it to uh, a couple seasons later than I thought it was going to be. And then it's it just got dragged out. I thought it was going to be early summer. It ended up being a December book. So we ended up with a little bit more time, which encouraged writers to slow down. I learned the deadline was in December and did not get them to me in March when I, you know, wanted them, you know. So things got, it's, you know, it's like herding cats, right? You, you've done, mm -hmm. you've done a couple of anthologies. Now you know what it's like. And you tell them that it's, you know, you need it by Monday and then Friday, you know, 
next Friday, you're still waiting. You're wondering what's going on, you know, but for, you know, for some of them, you'll, you'll wait forever. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying it was Orson Scott card that, you know, made me, made me wait an extra, you know, a couple of weeks there, but he needed a little more time. He's teaching, right? So we, we stretch things out. So, yeah, but it'll, it's what? finally off to the copy editor. So you'll be getting your copy edit notes soon. Oh, cool. Cool. Um, what's the darkest story in that one? Man, it's yours is up there. Okay, so good, good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> there's one, there's one by Jessica Kane that is another cosmic horror story, and it's all done in, you know, in the like the vein of the Lovecraft sort of epistolary stories, all done by email, right? And yeah. uh, and it is, it's pretty bleak. The email thing was kind of experimental, and you know, some of it's not punctuated correctly on purpose, right, and stuff. But it was kind of a neat story. But it's also, you know, it's got a pretty downer ending, right? It's it, you know full-on Cthulhu-esque monster taking over the world, right? You know, and, and my stuff's usually pretty dark. I don't think that my story in it is the darkest story I've ever written, but it's dealing with some pretty extra-dimensional, scary monster, you know, stuff as well. But I think it's less bleak, perhaps, than than uh, yours or, or 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 Jessica's. So yeah, I wouldn't say it's the darkest story I've ever written, though. Like yeah. I, I've I've gone much much darker me too um, the last one i did for bane in a concentration camp and it's so yeah you're rolling the dice on that one my friend you're yeah well you're it, was, the... it was an alien one so it's yeah. oh okay it wasn't uh, yeah well, anytime you write something in like it wasn't in yeah, world war ii or anything treblinka or whatever like you yeah, have no. to be you have to be very very respectful and reverent right because it actually happened and, and yeah lost. i'm very nervous about writing uh historical fiction for that for for that reason and for general accuracy's sake i'm a big i'm very persnickety about historical films right because like the romans didn't wear leather armor stop it right like i hate this now you know i'm really bad about watching roman movies and so i i'm very nervous about about doing that myself that's why i you know i, I there's a joke actually in the books for people who really know their stuff, right? Where you would think, you know, if a Saturian commands a hundred people, it was actually 80, but like, you know, confusing. You'd think that a Decurian would command 10, but a Decurian does not refer to anything like that, right? But mm -hmm. my empire misuses the word, right? And and so it's a joke, right? But every now and then I get a letter from another classics buff who's like, are you using the word wrong on purpose? Because like I expected better of you. You are using it, you are using it on purpose. Like, I'm wrong using on purpose. it wrong on purpose, yeah, because it's the kind right. of mistake that people do make, right? And, and you're, it's a mistake that you can make if you're writing in a science fiction setting instead of writing a historical piece. And Well, I mean, we, we can take a real world example, like the word decimate. Right it is one that people misuse all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, you I mean, you could also argue that the the meaning has changed shifted, over the yeah. centuries, right? So yeah. you know, most people think think it means to utterly annihilate, right? But obviously, it was when a Roman unit was punished, it's kill every tenth man, basically. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I do decimate a unit in book three, so you you get to see the word used properly. So interesting. I, I, that's another email I got. I'm very glad to see I used the word right because they were tired of seeing it used, more, used incorrectly. So, but yeah, no, no, no. So no, it was, uh, it was an alien sort of uh, prison camp, right? Not, not a historical one. I haven't written, I haven't written anything except one Marvel comic story that was not set in the Sonic universe. So everything has been, it's a, you know, when you have a whole galaxy, you can kind of find a space to fit any story into. And, and I, I I've always been kind of, like taken with the like giant sprawling fictional projects right like i'm not a big stephen king guy but the fact that like most of his books kind of fit into this sort of overarching plan when it feels like they shouldn't right is kind of cool right you've got you know randall flag out there like showing up in weird books where you wouldn't expect him to be like that's neat right so being able to do that with the short stories and also to like contextualize you know the the main books is really fun because the books are all one guy's version of events right it's written in his mm -hmm. voice right so if i do a short story and it contradicts his version of events right that's not a continuity error right that's not breaking canon that's deepening it right that is you know saying something about how we understand history ourselves right because it's you know, we you really often have to approach history forensically, right? Because you can't necessarily trust, you know, our guys, and you can't trust the other guys, and like what actually happened, right? Nobody, 
you know, it's really hard to know. Absolutely. Right. Right. Um, to the victor, to the victors go the spoils. Right. So they get, yeah, the, yeah. they get to write, they get to write the history. Yeah. And worse than that, their nerds get to write the history. Right. So like there's an even extra layer of, of removal and bias involved sometimes. And so being able to play with that in fiction, right, is really interesting because uh, you've got like the example I always use is there, are, I think, four biographies of Alexander the Great from like within about 500 years of his life. And they don't agree on a lot of stuff. Right. There's a story where he's going to consult the Oracle at Siwa, right, in Egypt. And in I think three of the four he is led to the oasis by birds, right? Because he sees birds and like, oh, there must be water nearby. In one of them, it's snakes, right? And the interesting thing about snakes is they're associated with Zeus, right? And so there is this tendency, and also with certain Egyptian gods, right? So there's this tendency to try and deify Alexander. And the thing about that particular, I think it's, I don't think it's Plutarch. I think it's Diodorus that has the snakes. I might be wrong been a long time is that but the point is right is that they're trying to lean into this idea of alexander as like demigod right because he's supposed to be you know a child of zeus according to his own like myth making right you know philip wasn't really his dad even like there are even parts where he tells the egyptians that like really my dad was your old pharaoh who's dead now right i'm actually the legitimate heir and so being able to tell all of those different stories you know one story to the greeks one story to the egyptians tells you a lot more about Alexander than reading any one of those biographies and being able to play even in a small way with that kind of idea in the storytelling by using the short stories that I've been writing has been really fun. And so being able to do these anthologies for Bane has provided me uh, with a lot of like weird story prompts that I might not have gotten to write otherwise. Like I might not have written an archaeology story, but having the excuse to do that, let me take the universe in a direction I might not have gotten to do that otherwise, or at least not wouldn't have done it as soon, right? So that's been really fun. Would you consider yourself a plotter or a pantser? Oh, oh I outlined very, very thoroughly. I wrote the first book off the cuff because I didn't have a due date. I think it took me about three years to write Empire of Silence. But the thing about getting a contract is they expect you to deliver books unless you're certain writers. And and so, you know, you have to turn the second book in. And you know, every, every writer I interview digs, like throws in that dig and we all know exactly which author we're talking about yeah oh i can think of i can think of a couple but, but yeah it, yeah, well, there's a, yeah there's yeah there's another yeah there's another one too that yeah it well it's it, it has to come up because you know it's it's hurting other writers right that's the thing right like do they owe readers anything you know yes i think but like Every time I go to a convention, I lose like one in three sales to readers who tell me they don't want to buy anything until it's done, right? And I don't blame them, right? Uh, I don't blame them, but and I'm doing yeah. fine, but there are writers who sell a lot fewer copies than I do who are really hurt by that, right? And that sucks, right? It really sucks for those writers. I mean, it still sucks for all of us, I think, because it's, it's, it's had an absolute, it, it's really damaged reader trust, but I digress. Uh, but I had to start outlining with the second book. And being, you know, employed by Bain at the time, I um, found an old David Drake outline, right? And yeah. he writes these crazy, like 50, 60 page single spaced outlines. And his books are like 100,000 words, right? So they're really, really detailed. The, the outlines mm -hmm. might be like 40% as long as the books themselves, right? And so I was like, well, if it works for Dave, maybe I should try it, right? And so I really only looked over the outline for like five minutes just to get a sense of how he was structuring these things. And I, I have outlined about as thoroughly ever since, you know, um, my books are, my outlines are about the same length, but my books are longer. So they're, they're not quite as comprehensive as Dave's are, but I've uh, outlined even my short stories since then. And I find that doing that is like pre-drafting, right? Even if I don't really look at the outline again, like I already know what the chapter is for because I've written a two page version of the chapter and that means I'm less likely to throw out the 20 page version, right? So I find yeah. that my revising has gotten a lot less messy. It's also been a lot less intensive and that's been really great. I'm a huge advocate. I think that if you're experiencing writer's block, outlining will probably solve your problem because you've probably just not figured out what the senior writing even is. Now that's not true of everybody. I know some people don't need them, right? And that's cool, but I, I find in talking to people who are trying to write that usually their problem would be solved just by outlining. And I, and I, I so I, I, I totally agree with you. I know exactly what outline you're talking about because I started to experiment that with that in January 
So I put together, you know, not quite as extensive, but like a 10,000 word outline. And, you know, it's, I'm six months into it, probably 25 chapters out of 40 written. Now, I, and I haven't been writing every day. Like I've been writing yeah. maybe, you know, 2,000 words every week or every other week. So it's not fast. But if somebody told me, you know, you need to get this book done this month, if I wrote every day, I would get the book done this month. Not only like I would finish writing it and then I would have to go back and add a lot of layers to it and char- you know, more characterization, et cetera. Because the other issue too, is I've written, for me at least, I've written a ton of short stories. So I'm a very parsimonious writer. And because I've had to be. And as a result, I, I have to go back and I have to add things in order to to, to kind of plump it up to the hundred thousand, the magic number. So I find that's a better problem to have than than the reverse, right? It's a lot easier to add stuff than it is to take stuff out, at least in my experience. And so that's I think it's a good place to be in. But it's it was amazing. It was like like night and day. That second book moved oh, so much more smoothly than the first one did. Unfortunately, with the, the subsequent novels, right? There's been like a complicated factor. You know, twenty 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 happened. You know, which impacted my my work at the office in, in a lot of ways, and that kind of took some energy away from writing itself. So it's hard to say, you know, if the books would have felt exactly as smooth as that second book. But to this day, Howling Dark, which is my second novel, I think is the one I, I it's the one I remember the most fondly. I don't know if it's the one that is the best, right? I think a lot of people really like book three, but uh, book two holds a special place in my heart because I feel like it's the one where I really like became a writer, at least in a professional sense, because I had to take it more seriously and more um, occupationally than I did. The first book was really a hobby piece, right? Because I I wasn't expected to deliver it in any sort of time frame, you know, and I was like writing when I was 18, 19, right? So like, you know, you, you have an infinite amount of time when you're 18. You know, I feel, you know, a lot more hurried, you know, 10 years later, you know, I really want to keep writing as much as I can now you know, which is a different sort of psychology to be in. But but yeah, so the outlining is, is crucial for me, crucial. So if folks wanted to check out your work, where's the best place to find you and your books? So the books are available wherever books are sold. If that's Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local store, whatever. My website is solanempire.com, S-O-L-L-A-N, Empire. It'll be down in the links. Uh, Thank you, sir. I've also got a YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, Sun Eater. I couldn't get suneater.com, unfortunately, but I do live streams pretty regularly, you know, answer questions from readers about books, about writing, got guests on intermittently to talk about publishing, you know, about literature, things like that, right? Try to keep it pretty close to the books, you know, so that's, those are usually the best places to go. I have been known, I used to have a Twitter. I don't anymore. Uh, I've got a Facebook page, uh, which, you know, maybe get a link in the description too, if you want to keep up with things, but the website's got my newsletter, you know, that's really the best place to go. So between that and the YouTube channel. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. It is always a pleasure talking to you and hopefully I'll see more of you in the future. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, my friend. If you enjoyed this video, Hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.